I've often made the comment that Russian State TV is great to watch if you want to get the idea of what Russians are consuming and you want to get Russian hosts of these shows most honest. If you put Russian state officials in front of the Western press, they're not going to come out and start saying that all the Ukrainian speakers need to be expelled from occupied territory. They're not going to come out and start saying we need to flatten every single city until there's no resistance left. They're not going to start reading like scripts on on their TV shows talking about the genetic impurity of the Ukrainian people, which the host we're about to watch has done in the past. So right here is a Russian state TV media host. Now, this guy has said some pretty crazy stuff in the past. Like I've said, he's read uh, read posts and, seg and done segments on the genetic impurity of the people pondering if Ukrainians interbreeding with Russians has made Russia a weaker country, and that's why the war is so difficult to win. He's He's pretty out there, but he is still on official Russian state media, meaning this is state press, meaning... This is associated with the government's position and it's funded directly by the government. So take that for what you will. I want to watch him talk about Russian Empire because in this segment, he probably goes more mask off about Russian Empire and the Russians intention to build empire than many other even state TV hosts who believe something similar. So let's listen. Today is a truly important day. Today is Putin has signed a law about a new holiday. On September the 30th, we will celebrate a very important day. A day of unification of a new region with Russia. The way it is defined is so-so. But on the other hand, it's open-ended. One, five, ten years from now, we celebrate this day. Listing new Russian regions. Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporozhye, and Kherson. So what he's talking about is around this time last year, and it, well, tomorrow, it's September 29th when I'm recording this, uh, around this time last year, the Russians annexed Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporozhye, and Kherson into Russia formally. That was before the Kherson counteroffensive that took back the capital of Kherson, the provincial capital, which is the only provincial capital the Russians have captured for the entirety of the war. And this was before the launch of the Zaporozhye counteroffensive. They also don't control the entirety of every single province that they've annexed. The one they've gotten closest to doing it is Luhansk, but they still don't control about one to two percent of it most of it they control i think for a short period they might have controlled 99 point like five percent of it but they've never controlled all of it but donetsk they don't have kramat well i'm in donetsk right now so obviously they, they don't control all of it i'm in kramatorsk so the city they want to capture and while they've been bombing it all day they haven't captured it the same thing with the city of zaporozhye same thing with the provincial capital they lost in Kherson and a tiny bit of Luhansk, which we went and saw the areas that they're being fought over right now in Luhansk, and the fighting over there is very, very brutal, very, very intense, and very constant. Anyway, the annexations of these territories is not successful if you don't control all those territories. And I don't know how you're going to celebrate something you didn't even achieve, but you announced you achieved. This, like, imagine that, you know, we had a holiday in the United States for when we bought all that land from Napoleon, when we did the Louisiana Purchase, and we called it the Louisiana Purchase, and we celebrated it, but we also then immediately lost Louisiana to the Spanish. Like, I don't know if we could celebrate it if we, we can't even control it. It doesn't really make sense. The list will be continued. I'm very much counting on it. I believe in it. So what he's saying is that Kherson, Zaporozhye, Donetsk, and Luhansk are only starting points, and they don't even control all of that, but they want to continue to build upon it. Usually what I'll see suggested by other Russian state TV presenters is Odessa, which has a large Russian-speaking community. That doesn't mean they support Russia. It just means that people there speak Russian. Another one I hear all the time is Kharkiv, and the people in Kharkiv threw the Russians out. Um, uh, doubt, again, 
just because they speak Russian there doesn't mean they want to be part of the Russians. They don't want to be Russian. Uh, but those are two oblasts, two regions that the Russians often talk about that they still want to annex. Based on the crazed reaction in the liberal social media and the platform ran by political... Okay, so when they say political slur for Ukrainians, they're talking about the uh, kohol, which is a insult for Ukrainians. It's a really, really bad slur for Ukrainians. Burns is an immoral, morally corrupt, corrupt bankrupt man. man. Who who subbed? Hey, Dank Pearl, thank you for the tier one and being sub for 24 months. Happy Friday. Hope everyone is well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I understand that it hit the mark. It's very painful, which means that it's very correct. Our ideology is being... By the way, that just shows that the international far right's main ideological purpose seems to be continuously trigger, triggering the libs, whether if it's in America, whether it's in Russia, whether it's anywhere. It seems that at the end of the day, there's nothing that makes any of them happier than triggering the libs, even if it means your country falls on the sword. Our ideology is being born right now. Not an ideology. One second, sorry, he talks kind of fast. Not an ideology, but the purpose is being discovered. Right now, Russia is discovering its purpose. The purpose is yet to be defined. Our government is very cautious. September 30th is the day of reunification of new regions with Russia. I think this day will be celebrated with trepidation in the remnants of Ukraine and some other places. You understand this list is incomplete. Everyone understands that this list is incomplete. For now, Russia doesn't dare to define what it really has in mind and what it's really all about. This makes it even scarier. This was often said in this studio and elsewhere. Of course, this is the revision of what happened in 1991. It doesn't matter how you call it or define it. You can use the most watered-down, meaningless or meaningful definitions. You can call it denazification or demilitarization. Call it whatever you want. Everyone knows what it really means. You know here is another surprising thing. Over there, they figured out what it means much sooner. In their own way, it's not only that they're exaggerating, dominated by historical myths and misconceptions. Which don't allow Western politicians and public figures to formulate it precisely, but they correctly understand the direction where everything is going. They call it the restoration of the Soviet Union. They say Putin wants to restore the USSR. For any Russian person, for any person of Russian culture, it sounds bizarre. For anyone who understands the retrospective of our national conscious for the last 1,000 years, for us, the restoration of the USSR sounds a bit funny. What Soviet Union? Wake up! We can rewind it by 800 years more. You won't feel better, you will feel even worse. Once you finally realize what this is all about, is the restoration of a Russian nation, the restoration of the Russian Empire. There it is. He lays it out as clear as possible. We can talk all days in what he called watered-down terms of denazification, demilitarization. You know, a lot in the West, they say the USSR, but we all know what it really is. I mean, any Russian person, anybody here in Russia really knows what, what, it, what we're really aiming for. I mean, we're not ending with Herzog, Zaporozhye, uh, Crimea, and Donetsk and Luhansk. We all know we're not ending there. We all know where this ends. 
the restoration of the Russian Empire. This is state media funded by the Russian government, operated by the Russian government, that gets its directives from Moscow. When they push a narrative, that narrative is at the very least okayed by Moscow. It might not be the exact position of the Russian government, but at the very least, they allow that to be aired. Let me give you an example. When Prigozhin was marching on Moscow during his thunder run, shooting down about eight or nine Russian aircraft, killing over 20 Russian airmen, shooting down even command aircraft, and having people put down their guns terrified of facing off with many of these people being prisoners armed with machine guns and tanks and armored vehicles and anti-air weapons. When all of this was, was going on, Russian state TV was endlessly looping music and it was cutting to commercial again and again and again and again. And the reason why they didn't really talk anything except for the most minute stories and they wasn't covering what was happening is because they weren't getting directives from Moscow on how to cover the story because the Russian government didn't even know how to respond to the attempted mutiny. Well, not attempted mutiny, it was a mutiny. This would not be airing without the at least uh, implicit approval of the Russian government. This is funded by the Russian government, and the narratives come from Moscow. This is him clearly stating that everyone knows where this ends. It doesn't end with the USSR. It's not all really about demilitarization or denazification or any of these watered-down buzzwords. It's about the restoration of a powerful Russia, the Russian nation, and its true destiny. That's him leaning into the old mid-19th century built by hardcore Russian nationalist philosophy of the Russian ideal. The, the Russia's destiny, Russia's true fate is to fight against the degeneracy of the West, fight against the Enlightenment for Christian God. For, for, for true Christianity, Russia's Christianity. It's leaning into those old Russian imperial ideas and then explicitly stating, we want to restore the Russian Empire. That is our goal. That is the end game here. How more explicit does this need to be? I understand this is Russian state TV. This is not a statement from Vladimir Putin himself. But when Vladimir Putin went into this war, he said that Ukraine cannot exist outside of it being an extension of Russia's power said that very clearly, that the only way that the Russian government will allow Ukraine to exist, and that's how he phrased it, is if it is an extension of Russia. And if it doesn't exist in that way, then it doesn't exist at all. That is a very clear colonial mindset. And the logic he laid out in the speech that he made at the start of this war could be used against Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, or any country that lies within the post-Soviet sphere. If you have been paying attention to the rhetoric on Russian State TV, and definitely this guy's show, this guy's a fucking loon. If you've been paying attention to the rhetoric of Russian government officials, their intention is to rebuild their empire. It is to politically dominate and control the nations that border it. As the largest country in the world. I understand that some people want to give Russia the benefit of the doubt, and I hear a lot of things about security concerns when people talk about NATO expansion and the idea that, oh, well, this is a country that borders Russia. We need to be, we need to be conscious of that. But a lot of people don't also recognize Russia is the largest country in the world. It borders a lot of countries. It borders Estonia, Latvia, Ukraine. It borders Poland through Kaliningrad. It borders Belarus, it borders Kazakhstan, it borders so many different countries. Do all these countries now have to serve to the whims of the Russian government, with the only one not doing so being the Chinese because they can stand up to them on their own? Look, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass and say that Russian state uh, media officials make government policy. They don't. They'll constantly fearmonger about nuclear weapons, but then you go to the Russian government officials and they could not say one-tenth 
of what the talking heads on Russian state media say, because they don't want to indicate to the international community that Russian nuclear policy has actually significantly changed, and they're now endangering the world with a nuclear disaster over Ukraine. They don't want to actually do that. That's why they haven't really changed the nuclear readiness level. That's why the United States hasn't changed the nuclear readiness level. And that's why they haven't made any statement when we're talking about Russian government officials, especially those at the top, haven't said anything outside of the lines of, we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in a situation where Russia's territorial integrity is threatened, which has been their position for forever. So I, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass and say this guy makes the policy for the Kremlin, but he would not be saying this without the approval of the Kremlin. And I believe that when someone tells you who they are, you believe them. Could you talk a bit more about the way Putin uses Christianity for some fucked up shit with his assets, Patriarch Kirill? I want, I'm, I'm going to be doing a main channel story on this very soon. I don't know when I say very soon. I don't know how soon, but hopefully by year's end. It's going to be called Ukraine's Warrior of God, and it's going to be me following around a, uh, a guy called Gennady, who is a pastor with 27 children. You've heard that right. His kids, 27 kids. Most... <laughs> I need to end stream. Bye-bye.